Our tradition of water communion, as I understand, goes back to a conference in the 1980s, a women in religion conference. Was anybody there? Anybody from our? You were there, Carol. <laughs> was a, a, a national gathering of Unitarian Universalists and, and I imagine others as well who were talking about this moment that feminism had come to a point where it was having a wide impact on religious traditions and certainly on our tradition. Our, our entire hymnal was, was rewritten in this era to replace Lord and, and so on and so forth, he and yada yada. And the ritual that they began the conference with was to invite the people from all over the country who had come together to bring water from their homes, from wherever they were coming from, and to merge those waters together. And this ritual was so meaningful and, and beautiful to those in attendance that it spread and became a tradition at many, most Unitarian Universalist congregations for the decades since. Now, I don't remember how old I was when someone told me, oh yeah, that water communion thing we do, it's just a chance for everybody to come brag about their great summer vacations. <laughs> what an elitist, yada yada. So, I thought we'd try something different. <laughs> We're, uh, we, we are in a drought, and uh, you might have heard the news the other day, our, our governor, told us that it's not a drought that, that we're in that's going to end. It's, it's just the new normal here in the western part of our continent. And so that, um, that was on uh, our minds. Caitlin and I were, were planting a garden this summer. And the question of how to do that in the face of, a, of, of drought, an ongoing drought. We had about 400 square feet of concrete that we didn't think wanted to be there anymore. Uh, our board president, new board president, Susan, um, said, oh, it's a reclamation project uh, when I was telling her about this at the beginning of summer, and I, I think that's exactly what it was. But we, we hauled out this, this concrete, well, uh, Claudio did actually, and a bobcat. And, and it was a relief because, you know what, I, my brother, who I trust about these things because he's a real scientist, he says that if concrete, all the concrete in the world were a country, it would be the third largest climate change creator of any country. So we got rid of that concrete. And we planted a garden instead, but to get there, we had to, we, there were layers, as there are when we're dealing with our, our, our droughts, right? There's that presenting layer of the concrete, but once you break through that, it's not, you don't find good soil right away, necessarily. Um, we found four inches of sand and a sheet of plastic and four inches of gravel under that. It takes longer than we want it to getting ourselves out of the dry places. But once all of that excavation, that digging and hauling was done, we laid down uh, piping to, to get the laundry water out into the garden. So the, the laundry, you know, you can do this gray water laundry to landscape thing. You get the, the pump of the laundry of the washing machine will pump the water out into your, uh, I, I didn't know anything about this. Caitlin and, and my drama, high school drama teacher, John, they figured it out and I got to be amazed and, and put in some hard work. And, and then we, we have this, this, this purple, you have to make it purple so that people know it's not drinkable. You, you, you put the purple tubing all over, and now every time we do the laundry, water goes out to water the fruit trees and the bamboo. And I think, I don't, I've never been in a household where, where we've been more happy, more excited to do the laundry <laughs> than these last few weeks. It turns out 
all we need for an abundant life, for healthy growing fruit trees, for nourishment and water, all we need is, is already here, is already there. The air in our right room downstairs has a gallon or two of extra water every day that we're pulling out of it with the magic of the dehumidifier. There is, if we're still enough, if we can remember to stop and look around, there is already a spirit moving amongst us, bringing that for which we thirst. So how do we live in a time of drought, whether it's a meteorological or emotional or, or spiritual drought? We engage in practices that help us to be still enough, to take stock, to bear witness of things as they are, to see each other and our world with clear eyes. And when we do, we might just find that the, the next drop of water that we need to sustain us, the next generous ear, the next helping hand, the next moment of grace, the next unexpected blessing is already rising to meet us. Mother Teresa reminds us that there are no big answers to big problems, just small ones. The next drop is all we need to quench our thirst. So I'll leave you today with Mary Oliver's poem, Thirst. This is a book my mom, Laurel, who's here, just retired from ministry, passed along. Another morning, and I wake with thirst for the goodness I do not have. Another morning, and I wake with thirst for the goodness I do not have. I walk out to the pond, and all the way, God has given us such beautiful lessons. Oh, Lord, I was never a quick scholar, but sulked and hunched over my books past the hour and the bell. Grant me in your mercy a little more time. Love for the earth, and love for you, love for the earth and love for you are having such a long conversation in my heart. Who knows what will finally happen or where I will be sent. Yet already I have given a great many things away, expecting to be told to pack nothing except the prayers which, with this thirst, I am slowly learning. May it be so, and amen.